Hey sellers, welcome to another Chapter E tutorial. This one's going to be E6 swimming. So we're going to cover everything you need to know about that. We're going to touch on forwarding. And um, yeah, so without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so looking at swimming. The rule does not give passenger riders, crew of an eliminated boat or an amphibian vehicle a survival opportunity. Unless the SSR specifies you have swimming capability, you do not. In which case, if either the boat or the vehicle is destroyed, so are its passengers. One water obstacle hex per movement phase is as far as you can move with possible drift in the advanced phase as per the paddle boat drift rules. Now paddle boat drift rules means you randomize which of the downstream hexes that you go to and the rate that you travel is based on the current strength. So again, first thing we have to do, much like in our um, boating video, we have to determine a couple things like current and direction. So first thing you do is you plop down your stream uh, direction. It doesn't matter which way it points because we're going to see uh, what happens. Let me roll one die and we have a two. Now again if it's uh, one or less then it would be a slow uh, current. If it was two to five it's a moderate and if it's heavy or if it's a six or above it's a heavy. To this die roll you add the EC conditions. So for us we're just going to use moderate. It's not going to be any conditions and moderate is going to be the strength of the current, which means that every advanced phase for the player that owns the unit, the counter will drift one hex downstream. If it were to be a heavy current, you would be drifting every advanced phase on both player turns. And then uh, we also look at the die itself. If we were an even die, then we keep the arrow the way it was facing. If it was odd numbers, say we rolled a three, then we would rotate it around to face the opposite way. Again, you can flip over the moderate to get the heavy. And if there is a slow current, then it's effectively uh, no drift. In the advanced phase, the only movement that's allowed to happen is entering a land hex, like leaving the water, or a pontoon bridge through a non-cliff hex site. And of course, the exception to all that is drift. Drift is only other kind of advancing movement that you, that can happen. If there was an abandoned or friendly boat or amphibious vehicle in the same location, you can also enter that vehicle or uh, boat in the advanced phase as well. You can also enter enemy occupied boats, but only if they're beached or if they're the paddled variety, because the German powered assault boat would be able to stream away from melee because it has an inherent driver. So if the boat is beached or paddled and you capture all the enemy passengers, you can take possession of the boat and enter it. You cannot fire or portage any equipment, even inherent firepower. Um, so you're typically in the water, you're represented by the unarmed unit. You're not a prisoner, you're just an unarmed unit and there is a difference. There's a good article from Jim Bishop online that, that delineates the difference between the two. Uh, he doesn't talk about the swimming rules because that's probably doesn't use very much. But uh, just remember, you're unarmed. You're not a prisoner. So you do have your inherent one firepower, which you could use in close combat. Should get to that. The exception, of course, is the rafting units, which we'll cover shortly. Now, swimmers have no CCV, so you cannot attack any kind of vehicle in close combat, nor can you tow boats. Again, for obvious reasons, you're not swimming there with a bit in your teeth and uh, pulling the boat across. You're not concealed or eligible for any train effect, nor does uh, moving an open or non-assault movement apply to swimmers. Of course, slow visibility hindrances will still apply, smoke, mist, what have you. Any fire directed at you is from HE or IFE equivalent is not halved. All other forms of fire are halved. If you're still in a non-fordable water obstacle at the end of your advance phase, you will have to make a drowning die roll. Again, this number is based on the uh, current strength, so you can see it there. And it's also an inherent drift die roll by using the colored die roll with no die roll modifier. So, for example, our unit enters the water hex. He has to take a task check in order to do so. So he passes. So our 747 that we were going to use enters the water. Now we in the advanced phase, so now we have to drift because we're using the paddle boat. We have to roll randomly, so the black die will be direction, and the white die will uh, hopefully roll low enough that we don't exceed our drowning die roll. 
So in this case, we went uh, four to six is the higher number. So we would come to T6 and a seven is well below the 10 at least, or the 11 that we need. So he's not gonna drown. Now in the next movement phase, they have to take another task check to move forward. They fail, so they're basically treading water and now they have to worry about drowning. So they do not, so they go one hex closer. And then you just keep repeating the process. So we wanna move forward again. So we do another task check. We pass it, so we are able to go forward. Now we have to do a drifting slash drowning die roll in the advanced phase, which uh, again, we're getting close, but um, it's still good enough to start moving. And you just go like this all the way across. So in the movement phase, you see you failed your, uh, your task check. So you must stay where you are. Now you have to worry about drift again. And we're getting really lucky. So you can see how it takes you a while to get across the river. And then finally you, you advance on the shore level and on your next move, you would be able to crest the wall and rise up. Remember when you're leading a water obstacle because water obstacles are a minus one level typically, unless you're flooded terrain, um, it, you're gonna be paying the height advantage plus the wall. So it would cost you three move to come from here go up to the top, jump the wall into this hex. So we have a 747 that wants to enter the water. So first thing we have to do is make a task check. Now, in terms of rafting, you have to roll the color die less your ELR. So typically, because 747s have an underline, it's an ELR5, so we'll use that. They do not, and they would have been able to uh, have enough rafting materials to go in, but because they failed, they're unable to enter the water obstacles. So let's try again the next turn. Uh, still, no joy. And then the third turn, finally get into the water. And because I rolled a five, they do not roll under their ELR. They do not have enough rafting materials. So they just become an unarmed uh, prisoner. If they had made their uh, ELR then they would actually take their normal form just with the caveats that you can see there you cannot fire you cannot uh, do any smoke grenades and um, you're basically carrying your small arms and any inherent support weapons as long as you don't have to jump so if you would have had to jump from this second level hill into the water you would not be able to uh, do the rafting die roll for obvious reason you're jumping off a higher level so if we have a cavalry unit, let's use a German this time. So same thing with uh, cavalry. Now there's no task check required, so you are able to just move into it. However, you can only move again one hex per movement phase and you're still gonna be subject to drift. So while there's no task check required, you're still subject to drift, so we have to roll. So uh, we're gonna be uh, coming back one hex is really strong current. Uh, typically the way it works, a one to three is a lower value, a four to six is a higher value hex. So again, T5, T6, so we would come back into T6. Second turn, we would go ahead forward again, one more hex. Then we have to do our drifting roll. Again, we're gonna come back and you can see how it's gonna work its way across. Eventually we'll crest the far side. So, and you can appreciate how long it takes. So I doubt very much you'd wanna swim across four obstacles. If you don't have boats, you may wanna use the bridges, but if you playing with bridges are just can be destroyed, you may not have no choice uh, to, uh, except for trying to swim across. But again, SSR typically have to specify you have that capability. All right, let's look at actually getting into the water. So remember, this is only allowed in non-frigid water obstacles, only enterable from a land or bridge location after a task check. If you fail a task check, it means you just can't enter the water. If you're already in the water, you're basically treading water. You're not going forward anymore. You're still subject to drifting, but you're just not going forward. And again, every movement phase, you're able to retake this task check until you get across the obstacle. You get close to land and you can jump out. You cannot enter the water obstacle in the advanced phase, only in the movement phase, and it sucks up all your move. You can also enter from a jumping uh, standpoint. So if you were up here on the second level cliff, 
we would be paying a plus two into the water. Um, this, I think there might be a discrepancy there because water is typically at a minus one level, so it should probably be a plus three. But the rules say right now that according to the example in the rule book that a second level cliff only gives a plus two die roll modifier. In any case, jumping from a high point into the water will require a morale check failure of which will probably see you broken and if you look further down broken when your units may not swim and are eliminated if already in the water now again if you fail your morale check you will not be able to enter the water so if you have a 747 up here in the the second level hill and it wants to enter the water it must take a task check, uh, morale check with a plus two so in this case we fail we rolled a, a modified nine so my unit is unable to jump into the water so you're not going to jump in and then break and then die. Uh, you make your roll to see if you can actually enter that location. For buildings to qualify for this rule, you have to use a counter width. So if we use this building here as an example, I would rule that this building would be in uh, meet those requirements. However, depending on your opponent, because again, the way the artwork is relation to the building, most of the building is not the counter width, but there is this little vertice. So um, I think it's it would probably meet the requirements to be a, uh, a building that you can jump from into the water. Um, but it may require a, a dice roll off or uh, definitely the agreement of your opponent, whether or not that's possible. Swimmers do not take pinning task checks and are not subject to pins, heat of battle, or leader loss morale checks. So again, if you are a squad with a leader, and you're swimming away and you suffer some kind of casualty result and it's a leader that dies the squad itself would not have to take any kind of morale check you you can continue on your way so let's look at fording now there's two entries in the rule book one is fording under b21.41 which is the water obstacle uh, subheading and then there's fording lines uh, chapter e 6.6 .6. Uh, these are always specified by SSR, and it essentially identifies a hex row that is both fordable and non-frigid. And it's a little bit different than a fording, although it does use the fording rules as a base, it adds on to that. So, uh, your swimmers and your armed, however, uh, pushing motorcycles and guns, again, is NA. It costs your entire movement factor allotment and subject to hazardous movement for every hex you're in. Swimmers that enter the fording line, if you have swimming capability, for example, and you enter a fording line, then you can continue down the ford. Uh, broken, berserk, wounded units that are fording via the fording line are eliminated as any fording, as is any fording unit that leaves the designated ford hex row unless a former swimmer. So again, that's a reverse of the previous point. If you're a swimmer, you step off the ford you can continue swimming. If you're a non-swimmer, step off the ford, then you're gone. Your units cannot fire if engaged, and you can eliminate a fording line much in the way you can a field foam by cutting the wire, as it were. In this case, by an unbroken unit that declares the attempt during the prep fire phase while in a land water location of the line, or by any motorized amphibian vehicle or boat that passes basically over the ford from one hex side to the next. And aside from that, you have the normal fording rules. So again, you're immune to pin. Uh, unlike in the fording, in fording lines, you cannot fire any inherent firepower. You could in the fording. Any support weapons, as you can see there, must be dismantled to be portaged by the fording infantry or cavalry. And any unit which breaks in a ford can actually low crawl or um, must move away as subject to interdiction, even if disrupted. Whereas in a fording line, they would be eliminated. Now, what the exact difference is, I'm not sure. I assume a fording line would be a much deeper version of the ford, and therefore it's more uh, difficult to uh, cross it without some kind of hindrance. But again, it doesn't really define the two, what separates them. Although fording lines does share the fording rules, so it's again, it could get a bit confusing. But make sure that you're aware of your fording and your fording lines. So let's look at an example. So we have a 467, and then we're going to have our 747 and our 91 attempt to enter the, uh, the fording location so they can cross the river.
So again, because we're using a fording line, these are fording line, not a ford. Um, typically ford would probably want to be over one uh, river hex, maybe a couple of river hexes, but a really long one, like for example, here to here, would be unlikely to exist unless the water is really shallow, in which case the whole river might be fordable. Um, so we want to have our unit here that advances through the fording line all the way across. So again, we have the two task checks to enter the water. So easily make it, so we enter the first hex. Again, we can only move um, one hex per movement phase. Now we don't have to worry about drift because we're walking on a ford. If we were to drift, for whatever reason, then we would be eliminated because unless there's swimming rules, again, you're eliminated if you're off the fording line. So at this point, our four, six, seven could defense a first fire at them and they would be subject to a minus two result. So we're gonna do that. So we're gonna be on the four table with a minus two. So moving in open and non-assault will not count. So it's gonna be a five on the four which is a one morale check. So uh, the leader first. He quite make, easily makes it, which means if 747 needs a seven to pass, they fail. So the officer's fine and the squad breaks. Now in the rally uh, road phase, these units will have to leave. Now, say for example's sake, our brave 747s make it right to the middle of the river at which time the same consequence happens. Again, they would have to leave. Their location and they would be subject to interdiction uh, at any point uh, along the road. So if they move here again, they'll have to take another shot with hazardous movement. So that'll be a casualty reduction towards somebody or uh, the, uh, the squad, I should say. So this will become a half squad. And then they can continue on their way. So as you can well appreciate, uh, crossing a ford or crossing any kind of water obstacle is uh, very um, interesting to say the least. You obviously want to try something else. However, again, depending on your victory conditions and if the SSRs allow for it, then by all means uh, try and use uh, try and use those rules to your benefit and get across the uh, pesky rivers and that's swimming uh, like I said a nice short video uh, risky business to say the least you don't want to be like those poor uh, Brits there in the water in the pitcher trying to practice for D-Day swimming across with equipment typically if you're able to improvise some kind of flotation like the Germans down there some kind of raft uh, you're probably better off and of course, if you're cavalry, the horse is doing a little swim for you, you're just trying to hold on for dear life. And, uh, you know, best case, you're in the, one of those amphibious tanks that can just sail through the water. Uh, so swimming, don't be afraid of it. Again, just one more tool in the toolbox for you to use. Uh, usually you're limited again by SSR. There's not many scenarios that I found on Scenario Archive that have swimming. Uh, I think there's a half dozen, maybe 10, and there's only one I saw that had a fording line, and that was from uh, Broken Ground Design, which I, I don't have, so I, I don't know the parameters of it. But um, that one there has fording lines, so yeah, uh, swimming. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Again, thumbs up if you think I earned it. Subscribe to the channel, please, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. We're going to be doing gliders.